Welcome. I'm clinical psychologist, Dr. Steve Thayer, and this is Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and mental health. My co-host is Dr. Reed Robison. Reed is a psychiatrist and a seasoned psychedelic researcher and clinician. Today, Reed and I are joined by Derek Moody. Derek is a physician's assistant with extensive experience in the use of ketamine to treat a variety of mental health conditions. In this conversation, we explore the many facets of the inner healing intelligence. We discuss its nature generally and the role it plays in psychedelic assisted therapy specifically. We get into genetics, evolution, the collective unconscious, superhero movies, multiple selves, and so much more. Please enjoy. Welcome everybody near and far. Today we're with our experts, Dr. Reed Robison and Dr. Dr. Steve Thayer. And, and Derek, who the heck And are you? myself. <laughs> and today we're talking, I think, about one of the most important concepts of psychotherapy. One that's, I think, really interesting and kind of a broad topic. The idea is the inner healing intelligence. This comes with many names, and so I think to make sure we're all on the same page, let's just kick it off by trying to understand what is the inner healing intelligence. So, Dr. Thayer, how, what is this? How do you define it? How would you describe what this inner healing intelligence is? Yeah, I think it's, this is not, at least in my mind, not a like super, like a very discreetly defined phenomenon. So I think in this conversation, we'll kind of find our way to it together. Peel away some layers yeah. of it. Yeah. When I, when I think about the inner healing intelligence, my mind goes back to my early education as a psychotherapist um, in humanistic psychology. So Carl Rogers was sort of the, uh, the flag carrier, at least when I was learning about client-centered psychotherapy in particular. And his concept of self-actualization comes to my mind, that mm -hmm. if, if as a therapist you give a client the proper supportive, warm, validating environment, they find their way to healing. So in my mind, the inner healing intelligence is this thing, this phenomenon inside all of us, that if given the right environment, will eventually walk us toward healing, walk us toward, toward health and growth. Mm -hmm. there, the body has an innate capacity and even a vector of direction towards restoring health, homeostasis. Uh, it's our innate capacity to heal, mm -hmm. right? Like when you get a cut or a scrape, the body knows what to do. In fact, uh, you know, I went out of town a couple of weeks ago on vacation. Uh, this is a bit of a tangent, but a, a funny story perhaps. Um, I was on the airplane coming home, and you know those uh, trash cans in the airplane bathroom where you push mm -hmm. it in and then it closes on you? Mm -hmm. So I. I washing my hands, use a paper towel, and I go to put the paper towel in the trash. And it's kind of an older plane, a metal lid. I was a bit scared of it pinching my fingers, so I pull my hand back quickly. But the, the metal lid caught my finger and sliced through the nail, the fingernail, um, right through my nail, halfway through. And, and we're at, uh, I don't know, 10, 20,000 feet, uh, whatever airplanes hang out at these days and uh, I see this blood gushing and then I you know apply some pressure and then I see things moving around the nail I couldn't really tell at the time but the nail was loose this is a bit of a gory story sorry everyone <laughs> Morning. Um, so but then uh, you know I wash it off and I realize okay this is gonna be fine um, but I was still concerned at home that night the next day of do I need to go get this addressed? Like, do I need medical attention for this? And I sat with that, um, and I didn't seek it. Every day for three, four days, I asked myself the same thing. So I started Googling like we do as uh, clinicians. You know, we look up the answers to our uh, conundrums. And uh, I saw that someone's advice, an ER doc who deals with this kind of thing a lot, he's just, he's just said, dip it in coconut oil 10 times a day and the body will heal itself and do salt baths for your fingers and so that's what I did and I was kind of blown away that when I contemplated the urgent care for like five days in a row by one week out I just knew the body is back on track 
it doesn't even look that bad, nothing needed. Mm. Uh, so that was my inner healing intelligence of my fingers and fingernails in right. action. <laughs> well, and even just general medicine as a, everything you guys are talking about is natural and then you bring up medicine and you're like, well, that's like the opposite of natural is what that often feels like. Mm -hmm. but, but what medicine is usually aimed to do and when they discover medications is they're hacking into natural mechanisms. Whether we find some plant in nature that's having a, natural effect on our yeah. just physiology or we understand the physiology well enough that we're like okay if we can manipulate and tweak this little thing then we can really take advantage of the natural systems in the human body to do healing so yeah like yeah. Did, did the salt baths and the coconut oil heal the nail or did they create an environment mm -hmm. that allowed yeah. the body Good to do what it does yeah. that knit that skin back together like if you break your arm the cast isn't the healing agent. The cast, it, it puts things in the right order so that they yeah. can do what they need to do, knit together. Yeah, one of my uh, favorite uh, therapy kind of gurus, mentors, uh, Irving Yalom, uh, group therapy guru, who you probably know mm -hmm. well uh, from following his work too. He, I remember something he wrote that struck me about our role as uh, as healers, as therapists, um, psychiatrists, clinicians, is to remove the obstacles that are in the way of healing and, and create the optimal conditions and then let the individual heal themselves. Mm -hmm. We get out of the way of the healing otherwise. Yeah, the phrase trust the process comes to my mind. Like what mm -hmm. process are we trusting? There are lots of different processes that are specific to therapy modalities or like ide mm -hmm. ideologies about how to live a healthy life. Um, but I think when we're trusting the process, maybe what's common across all of these modalities and ideologies is this innate healing intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I like, the, I like the word intelligence with the inner healing intelligence because mm -hmm. that implies that it knows something. Right? Yeah. It knows what to do. There's an aim and a direction with that. You know, mm -hmm. w when you're looking about what to do, you're the, one of the most fundamental frames that we encounter in day-to-day -day life is what am I going to do? What am I going to do with my life? And, and I think that's cool because when we think of healing, and especially a lot of these metaphors are actual healing, cut, this is going to heal. Mm -hmm. But a lot of the healing that people want in their lives have to do with aim and direction. Mm -hmm. And that's where when you bring up the idea of self-actualization, that this inner healing intelligence is relevant in regards to the concept of self-actualization. That's what are you going to do with your life? Who are you going to be? The... And, and you had a quote, I think it was a good one, if you still have it written down and can share it, something like, with sure. a, like a seed knows how to become the tree. Right. It, it has all the information, the intelligence inside of that to become what it needs to be. And, and so when you bring up the idea of self-actualization, for each individual, there's something in us that knows the direction, knows the path to becoming who and what you're supposed to be, which is similar to healing your being and your healing are kind of, there's a tremendous overlap there that's worth noting. Yeah, I like that. Well, happy to share this quote. Yeah. I do have it handy still, uh, although I don't know who said it. <laughs> so, <laughs> author unknown, um, comment, and don't forget to like and subscribe too, <laughs> if, you, if you know who said it. Um, the potential of the oak lies vibrating within the atomic structure of the acorn, as does the flower live within the bud and the self within each of us. So my take, if the obstacles are removed, just as an acorn develops into an oak, we can each develop into a mature, fully self-actualized being. And uh, an acorn doesn't wonder what it's to become. It simply becomes a mighty oak tree. Right. right? And an acorn doesn't need to be taught how to become a mighty oak tree. Yeah. It, it needs a, the right environment, the right um, support, and removal of obstacles. Well, and when you bring up the example of the acorn, I, I, I'm thinking in the back of my mind, so what's the obstacle? What's the obstacle that we have to accessing the inner healing intelligence? And I'm like, well, the difference between me and an acorn is I'm conscious. So is that the right. obstacle? Like my yeah, consciousness totally. oft times is the actual obstacle because I'm overthinking things. I mean, that, that as I say that out loud, it sounds pretty accurate, but it's it's an interesting thing that you kind of, demonize, you criminalize consciousness as part of the, the, the pathology of accessing the inner healing intelligence. Mm. I think you're on to something though because I do believe that the mind 
makes a terrible master but a beautiful servant, as they say in the contemplative practices. Um, so that monkey mind that it's sometimes called can run amok. Um, and that, I, I would say, is one of the obstacles to healing that we can do as clinicians and um, whatever you'd call it, not healers, we're assisting people in their self-healing uh, by helping them get out of their head and into their heart, the mm -hmm. wisdom of their body, their intuition, their lived experience. Yeah, I, I mean, this is maybe not neurologically accurate, but I think of we share a lot of the same instincts with animals that uh, have kept them alive. But we have this newfangled neocortex that uh, where perhaps a lot of this conscious self-reflection and ability to project into the future and worry about it occurs. And it seems like that those two things, they have a sort of, I don't know, a gentleman's agreement, but it's mm -hmm. not, <laughs> they don't always get along real well. Oh, yeah. So, you know, we get traumatized and uh, our nervous system is now reacting to things as if they're threatening when maybe they're not threatening. But our conscious mind is telling us, no, this is threatening. It reminds me of uh, Robert Sapolsky's book, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. Yeah, you know, I we, remember that one. We have you know, great title. The lion, the lion comes in and they freak out to you know defend themselves. But as soon as the lion's dragged off the youngest or weakest among them, you know the the zebra doesn't have PTSD. It's not. It goes back to no drinking from the water hole. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, that reminds me of Bessel van der Kolk's. Uh, you know, actually, it's Peter Levine in uh, his work on somatic experiencing, but although I think they both mention it, that animals in the wild, when traumatized, just know what to do, not because of the size of their smart neocortex um, evolved, but they just innately know through the wisdom of this, of evolution, to go out in another field and shake it off, move the energy and release it, but in, the, in that example, the modern way of life and our overthinking gets in the way, like, oh, I can't go in the other room and shake. That's not, that's not what I was conditioned to do or yeah. like taught to do um, by culture. Yeah. yeah, you might have all kinds of judgments about going into the other room and shaking, like, that's weird. But weird is not a thing, in, weird is not something you put under a mi microscope and identify. Weird is a is a condition judgment, yeah. judgment yeah the kind of taking some of the at least the metaphor that you're using of animal and natural response mm -hmm. she kind of maybe tweaks it in a slightly different direction but you know living in modern society right now i just always imagine in my head society ends and i'm just i'm gonna die there's no way i'm gonna survive out there but and when i take a second thought and i try and look at that honestly for some reason I actually trust that I could. Because mm -hmm. when I look at other people's lives, I, you see people do things that they are just totally not capable of. Mm. Uh, that, totally that you wouldn't imagine that they would be capable of. And there is this survival instinct in us that because of our society and the protection that we have, we don't tap into that. So that would be just again another way to point to what the inner healing intelligence is. That it can even be found in survival instincts which yeah. lie extraordinarily dormant until you're actually in an environment where it's like people will say something just took over me and it knew how to react to the situation. It's making yeah. me think about the mental health crisis that we hear about you know in the news and that we talk about in clinician circles. If the world has never, arguably, the world has never been safer, especially in the more developed areas of the world, um, we've never been more comfortable, and yet we're pretty miserable, like a lot of yeah. us are. Suicide rates high, you know, everyone's on Prozac or whatever. Um, and it might be because in a short period of time, we've gone from this type of environment we evolved to exist in to this newfangled one, which is pretty awesome, but maybe neurologically we're actually not really well suited to it and we've um, we've sort of developed all these obstacles and obfuscations of this inner healing intelligence and it might be part of why mm -hmm. we're having this mental health crisis it's interesting when you bring up the mm -hmm. idea of, of the change of environment and climate maybe you know more about this specifically or you can correct me if I'm just making crap up <laughs> but uh, the there's some concepts uh, and this can go a little too out of control but with epigenetics where legitimately you have 
stuff in your genes coded that are not expressing that they again you have this idea of they're lying dormant within you so when you have the saying that you're more than you could be that's genetically true especially if you look at an eight-year-old he's definitely genetically more things genes are going to activate and get expression but this can happen in multiple stages in life and one of the main things is a huge change in environment a huge stressor will put you in this new environment that will actually catalyze something within you to turn on particular genes and then those genes start these huge physiological processes that will basically equip you for this certain change of environment which is pretty cool to think of and again an example of this very broad and complex idea of an inner healing intelligence any of that yeah. epigenetic stuff accurate or maybe <laughs> no it is it is and it's a it's a fascinating one my my uh, mind is just spinning around so many different thoughts because we talk about in uh, the genetics field we talk about the two hit hypothesis of say cancer uh, where you could be born with a, a cancer susceptibility gene. An example might be P53 tumor suppressor gene is uh, you're born with a variant that makes it less efficient at getting rid of like potential cancers as they start to grow. And then you have an environmental insult like a lot of sun exposure, uh, smoking. If you had the susceptibility plus environmental hit, two hits, there's cancer, like the perfect storm of biological, environmental, or an epigenetic interaction. But we, what we don't think about is the, I think what you're alluding to is the innate resilience that we can have hard-coded. Uh, even more uh, strong is our evolutionarily wired um, tendency to survive and heal. And mm -hmm. we don't think about how there are those um, innate superpowers that you can just unlock in the right conditions. Yeah, because it's hard to describe what this is. That was the original question, like what is the inner healing intelligence? And so to some degree, it's, it's fun to point to some of these biological phenomena all the way down to genetic code, which is like so small, we can't even really conceptualize that when you're really trying to think about what that actual matter is. So there's something material about this inner healing intelligence, which is a cool overlap because it also falls into this other realm that's highly spiritual, where yeah. you can find manifestations of inner healing intelligence. I think when we were talking beforehand, we used the example of Black Panther, the movie, yeah. where in that they're using somewhat of this shamanic, quasi-psychedelic ritual for him to access something. So in this sense, it's this highly profound spiritual component um, for him to access this healing inner, inner healing intelligence. Well, what he accesses in the movie is his ancestors. Hmm. It, ma it makes me think of Carl Jung's collective unconscious, that there's maybe something transpersonal inside of us um, that, is, that maybe is constructed of uh, ancestral wisdom, ancestral uh, connection, yeah. that if we get out, get out of the way of, can hmm. there's a lot of wisdom you know in the past that can guide us toward actualization guide us toward toward healing yeah it's another example of how we talk about intergenerational suffering and mm -hmm. trauma getting passed along but there's also intergenerational wisdom and lessons learned through generations of experience these and I karmic cycles of yeah. of existence. Well, and again, my brain goes right back to genetics and things like reflex. You know, this I, it's hard to con conceptualize a collective unconscious, so abstract, very philosophical, spiritual idea to, to really wrap your mind around. But it's, if it's this idea of that there is this intelligence or consciousness of the past that you can access. And you'll see a representation of that in Black Panther, where he's having a dream and talking with his ancestors. But we have the ancestors in us with genetics, mm -hmm. like all of the things that it took millions of years to evolve to adapt to a certain environment are there within you. And sometimes you do have to step out of the way and just let that natural healing, those reflexes, that evolutionarily guided yeah. thing take place that is a reflex to adapt to a particular insult and, and terrible situation environment. You know, uh, I think about that sometimes in terms of the current situation we're in collectively. Uh, we're all in a bit of a hot mess as a society, like as a 
human race with the global pandemic, but also the world seems like it's never been so torn with rioting in the streets and political unrest. And I'm just looking at it like from the Western world perspective too. Um, but along those same lines, I wonder sometimes if that's why this countercurrent of um, increased focus on our mental health, uh, the psychedelic renaissance is coming back because collectively we have an inner healing intelligence too. Mm. Well, here's the, here's the puzzling question. Is nature the culprit or the cure? Because I'm, I'm coming up with these examples in my mind where it can be both. Like, a lot of times we look at psychopathology as the culprit. Like, you, something natural occurred to respond to a situation, and that's where you're stuck in this mess. Um, this would be, I'm, I'm yeah. all about movies. That's like, that's the only reason I'm here is for <laughs> movie my expertise in movie references, <laughs> but Castaway, Take that for example, he kind of has this psychotic relationship with a volleyball, Wilson, and I look at that as extremely healing and therapeutic, but oh, yeah. then you can also contextualize that as pathological. It's like, oh my gosh, he's losing his brain, he's talking with a volleyball, that's insane, right? So it's interesting to look at this culprit and cure, and especially with you know about like IFS, internal family systems, psychotherapy, that there's some interesting concepts there I'm yeah. sure that help. It's both, in my opinion, okay. is the obstacle is the path, in fact. And uh, so from an IFS standpoint, or just let's look at parts work in general. If you have a, a strong inner critic that develops, we were talking about the ruminating thinking mind running amok. Uh, say you have a strong self-critic, that could have emerged for a number of reasons. It could have emerged because you were heavily criticized as a kid and and took that on or it could have even emerged for the opposite reason it could have been because uh, your tribe was not honest with you uh, and only gave positive feedback always saying you're the best singer in the world and then one day you go audition for American Idol and you make a fool of yourselves and it's shameful and you internalize that and take on an inner critic that protects you from that kind of shame again as another end of the spectrum but but point is, once you have a strong inner critic, it doesn't help to yell at it. You know, that will <laughs> actually make it stronger, but a path forward is loving it back into the light. You know, like loving awareness of, thank you for protecting me from that kind of wound at a time when it was needed. But you know what? We've got this together. Let's reintegrate as parts um, and see things for what they really are now. Of we don't need this incessant dialogue of putting me down to protect me from that shame because we've learned some things along the way. Mm -hmm. I don't know, but what's your uh, take on the parts and inner healing? It was making me think about um, like what are the qualities of the inner healing intelligence? Like how do we know when it's active versus our own monkey mind, like you're saying, or mm -hmm. any, any number of these different parts that show up. Because um, from that, the internal family systems perspective, there is a capital S higher self that perhaps is synonymous with the inner healing intelligence mm -hmm. that has certain qualities about it, right? It's, yeah. it's compassionate, it's calm, aware, it's calm, yeah. Yeah, all the C's. Um, and then uh, there are other, other sort of qualities of the inner healing intelligence, like it's emergent. It sort of just shows up out of nowhere. When somebody says, I just had this idea out of nowhere, um, you know, that's kind of what it's like. And it's non-linear. It's mm -hmm. not like, mm -hmm. these are the five steps to activating your inner healing intelligence. And it goes this, 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 then this, then this, and then you're at the top of Maslow's hierarchy and you're self-actualized. It seems to be more like it yeah. shows up with what you need when you need it. And it's not always going to be clear to you why it does. And yeah. it, I think a lot of it just goes to this aspect of a complete process. And there's going to be multiple players along the path here. Um, you once, I think you said this once, that this is a phrase you like in psychotherapy. How is that working out for you? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. the, maybe that's one of the ways that you can tell when you've reached the end of a particular natural, like this was a natural response that was designed to get me to this point, 
but now I have to let go and move on to something else in order to complete the journey and complete my healing. And so that phrase of how's that working out for you is usually a way of letting yourself know like you need to let go of this part of your journey and move on to the next step. And most of the yeah. time people, it, it's funny because there's like these individual points, but there's also this over, overlapping, uh, overarching concept. So the inner healing intelligence takes place in both. It can be, hey, this, this fight or flight response was actually part of my inner healing intelligence to get me from this point to this point. But now I have to let go of that component of the inner healing intelligence to get to the overarching thing and, and to, in order to complete the process. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you guys followed that. No, I, I do. <laughs> it, it makes me think of a couple examples. Uh, when we're talking about this idea of the obstacle as the path, the only way out is through, and the, the uh, awareness of different parts needed at the time, uh, makes me think of the concept uh, that Stan Groff talks about, uh, you know, famous psychedelic physician uh, in terms of psycho-spiritual emergencies or, as, uh, or even a, a psychotic type crisis in one's life or a complete nervous breakdown or midlife crisis, whatever it may be, it could be a very positive uh, step on one's journey and I think about uh, a lesson I learned out in ayahuasca retreat settings. Uh, this, when I first started working um, with a, a retreat group internationally, they told me about a story that happened the year prior where a lady um, during an ayahuasca ceremony had a psychotic break and they didn't know, uh, well she hadn't had these before, but it was impressive and it lasted a long time and they do not use psych meds, they don't use antipsychotics for that because they have a belief that you let things run its course and there's an inner healer at work and so what they did instead was safely, compassionately guide her to a setting where they could hold space and brought in a, a doc from an, an Ibogaine clinic down the river to help consult and watch over things because she'd seen a lot of things and uh, they just took turns sitting around the clock two at a time and through the course of one to two weeks the psychosis started to subside. It's a long time mm -hmm. but then uh, you know what she was she was uh, not only through that but better than when she came in and when I arrived in the jungle with a bag full of meds and defibrillator and everything else uh, the shamans and medicine team they're like you're not going to need that <laughs> thank you for bringing it and uh, it's good to have right um, the inner healing intelligence sometimes needs some drastic interventions right in the case of a big tumor that needs to be taken out or sure. something but it was uh, a, a very insightful moment for me because as I dug into the literature after I see that you know what when even in psych wards when people let mania or psychosis run its course in a supportive way rather than immediately numbing it out or hitting it with heavy-duty meds uh, the outcomes appear to be even better like less recurrence or you've gotten something out of your system you've moved through a energetic process um, yeah. I've been curious about since that time it's interesting in that example, the, uh, my, my culture, my Western civilization is, is kind of looking at that. It's like, man, we can't do that today. And, and how often I hear patients mm -hmm. when, they're, when you're in discussions with them, like, what do you need right now? And it's so often, I need this, but I just can't do it. Because my culture, and I'm a big fan of Western civilization because I'm going to mm -hmm. go home and in a nice bed and watch TV and play Nintendo, thanks Western <laughs> civilization, but it does get in the way a lot of times. Like yeah. the nine to five, that's not always the most conducive to healing. So when you give this example of like two weeks sitting down and supporting somebody, writing that through, I have like 30 minutes per appointment. That doesn't work in sure. medicine. Yeah. But yeah. That, that points to something really, I, I've found that remarkable because it does point to again, this idea of something natural and just, if we're willing to sit long enough with a person and let things flow and be patient, two weeks patient, maybe more. Well, yeah. it, sounds, it, it sounds very different than you know, a, a psych ward in a hospital, mm -hmm. which is 
you know, depending on where you're at, can, can feel like a prison. I know some people who, yeah. who have uh, been hospitalized, maybe not for psychosis, but for you know, really acute suicidality, who, who, uh, for whom their hospitalization was another trauma in their life, hmm. instead of it being you know a place that facilitates growth and healing. Um, and of course, like I'm not trying to crap yeah. all over all the wonderful things that hospitals do and and, uh, and medicine can do. Well, Western civilization appears again. Thanks, Western civilization, for right. hospitals. But there is some definite room for growth because the, the mentality, generally speaking, in hospitals is we got to get you out as soon as possible. Keep it yeah. moving. Keep it, keep it moving. And you don't get to spend two weeks right. just meditating and sitting down and having constant support. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, you're right. Just hearing that, it's like, oh, that's beautiful. Wouldn't we all wish for something like that? And but there are little ways of, of doing that, bringing it into our settings. Like, uh, think of the power of a compassionate, loving nurse in a psych unit mm -hmm. for someone's experience. Like, it could be absolutely game changing to have one, like, beacon of light and hope in something like that. Or I used to work with uh, foster kids and proctor kids. And I was struck by the data. Uh, that showed that the number one predictor of their success of, of getting through the traumatic upbringing they've had and getting on track towards meaningful positive strides in life was not the medicines or the therapy I would do with them. It was the presence of a supportive other in the form of a mentor yeah. or someone they could, they could just feel their presence and support now and then, or feel some love, uh, like maybe that lady did as she was being supported um, over a couple of weeks yeah. in her psychosis. I mean, I, I can't think of how many times I've done all my best psychological voodoo and, and ninja tricks mm -hmm. to help somebody self-actualize, become aware and heal, and maybe they get a little bit better, and then they get a romantic partner, and all of a sudden, they're healed. <laughs> like, all of a sudden, they yeah. don't need therapy anymore. It's like it, what they needed was connection and love beyond mm -hmm. what I could give them in a the therapeutic setting. Mm -hmm. I'm also think I'm I'm currently reading um, James Fadiman's book, The Symphony of Selves, and oh. it's making me think more about the selves and the inner healer. And in there, he talks about people with uh, dissociative identity disorder, mm -hmm. kind of maybe the most extreme version of of selves at play. And he gives the example of this one individual who, had, who one of his alters, one of his selves called Timmy, um, really liked orange juice. Mm. And the other selves were all allergic to orange juice. If they drank orange juice, they would get hives. <laughs> but if Timmy was online and drank orange juice, this is a real person, like this happens, yeah. he wouldn't get hives. And I don't know everything about DID, but I do know that uh, the, the power of belief to affect physiology is real. You have yeah. people with autoimmune conditions that get better when they have love and support. Um, and you know, I'm not claiming that if you just uh, you know, hold a crystal and, and drink kale juice and have a lot of love <laughs> in your life that you'll live forever, but there's, there's something to it. There's something to the power of belief. Well, yeah. and so the question that comes to mind is just like, what, what can we do to cultivate this? What can you do to cultivate this in a medical practice and psychotherapy or even at day-to-day -day home? Because like, like you said, this concept is so central, so powerful, and um, it works its way obviously into the psychological literature, and you can find ways of tying this into many different concepts that are found across religions, mainstream religions. Um, around there because it's such a prominent idea that there is this internal healing intelligence. So what, how do you cultivate this? How do I, how do I get more of this? I want some more. <laughs> uh, you know what comes to mind for me is the fact that uh, MAPS and their MDMA therapy research, they focus on this as a central kind of tenant of the therapeutic approach and the healing process is get out of the way of the medicine and the inner healing intelligence. There's even a uh, an acronym uh, that shows up in MDMA therapy called WAIT. Why am I talking? Um, so really giving space for the inner healer, uh, taking the time to let 
ask the client, prompt them, guide them towards checking in with themselves, help them find their intuition again, uh, trust themselves, find the little wins, um, and just uh, and all the while avoiding imposing your theoretical frameworks on the equation, right, or mm -hmm. telling them what to do. But what do you yeah. think? I mean, we, we have a theoretical framework in the sense that we believe that this inner healer is, exists mm -hmm. and that um, we, we are deferent to it. And we want to maybe coach the client to do the same. We'll coach the client to, um, I guess, explain the concept, of course, uh, so that they're, because they might be coming to us for answers. Hey, man, tell me how to get yeah. better. Tell me what's wrong. Tell me how to get better. Uh, and, I, and I will say that this, like guiding a session in this way works really well for some and less well for others, especially the highly anxious people who um, want answers and want control. Yeah. But I think, you know, we want to uh, coach awareness. We want to coach inner, like referencing inward. Um, we want to coach mindfulness and curiosity. Beginner's is mind. A big one. Yeah. yeah. And uh, no, I think that that non-directive communication is important, even though some might want to be told what to do, like you were saying, that is in general less conducive to inner healing intelligence right. coming on board. Uh, and I think you're, you're good at that from what I've observed, Derek, is just like you might want to consider this or how about we try this. And I like that approach too is uh, just um, suggesting to help them trust themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. I like the I wonder question yeah. too. So if somebody, even if you could even use it if someone is saying like, I need you to tell me what to do. And some, some clients find this obnoxious and it's very stereotypically ther like therapist talk. But um, you know, I, it seems like you really want me to tell you exactly what to do to get better. I wonder where that's coming from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, you guys can kick me off later. So here's my mm -hmm. Bible reference. I don't even know if I remember the story. It's a, uh, it's either Elijah, Elisha, I always mix those guys up. Mm -hmm. Something about, uh, there's a guy who's a leper, he's like a king, and he goes to a prophet and says, um, I want my leprosy cleaned. So the prophet tells him to go to like this dirty river and wash yourself in that, which is like this really obscure, why in the world would you do that? And um, I won't go into a whole Sunday <laughs> school lesson on that, but the, the reason I wanted to use that as an example is I do believe that if you take a moment to sit with yourself and you ask yourself, what do I need? You can get an answer. And, and it may not be the answer that you were looking for, just like in, that's why I went to this weird Naaman example in the Bible, yeah. go, go here, because a lot of times where we mentioned our consciousness a lot of times gets in our own way. We're looking for an answer like the clear end of all things. But sometimes it's just like something small. You need to go talk to your kid like that and and it's mm -hmm. not until you do that that you're gonna get the next step and the next step like you have to trust in this complete process and I personally I'd say one of the ways of accessing and getting down to that inner healing intelligence is by trying to let go and give yourself space to listen so if mm -hmm. I bring in a Christian example I'll counterbalance with some Buddhism and that's the whole idea of non-attachment and nirvana, because yeah. nirvana occurs once you have detached from everything. So you have to let go of your ruminations. You have to let go of this coping mechanism that was there for a time and wonderful and be mm -hmm. grateful for yeah. that and let go of the next and the next and the next and just let all that dissolve till you can get to that small, simple answer of just like, this is where I need to go next. This is that small next step in my process of healing. And I, I really believe people can get there and that they have that. It's an awesome thing to be, just to see. I love that. And if I could give one practical tip to uh, work on that, that I, that I like to remind myself to do and clients as well is uh, setting a reminder somehow to check in with yourself, asking your inner healing intelligence, ask your nervous system, ask your body, ask your heart, what do I need? Checking in, like, what am I experiencing? But also taking it further, like, like you said, um, looking for that uh, wisdom within you to guide your path. When you brought up safe environment, like when you're working as a therapist, one of your main goals is like, I'm here supporting you giving you safety because mm -hmm. it's probably not very easy to get down to that level when you're just like there's fire everywhere like right. my house is on fire okay let's meditate 
take 10 minutes, sit down, figure out what do I do next. It's like there, there's that time and space. So a lot of what you can do, just this may just be for like the lay person. How do I help people bring that out of them? That's where it's those just be compassionate, be very patient. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, validation, acceptance, and seeing people. Like, if, if you believe that there's fire all around you, then the parts of you that have kept you safe from fire your entire life are going to have the microphone. They're going to have the steering wheel. And good, right? Until they're self-defeating because there actually isn't fire around you. And so they're hurting you in that way. So I think one of the most healing aspects, the most useful thing about seeing a therapist is you have somebody who's who's seeing you. I mean, they are they are they are completely there for you. You're not there for them. It's really hard to have a relationship like that in your in sort of your normal life, and it's an unconditional acceptance. Whatever shows up, I'm cool with. And uh, so, hopefully, the idea is that those other selves that have been bracing and protecting and maybe self defeating, will get the message. Like, okay, we don't need to be on duty right now. And then it creates space for the inner, inner healer to show up or maybe other exiled selves to show up um, that uh, haven't been able to speak. So, I mean, apart from it just feeling really nice to have somebody listen to you mm -hmm. in a way that almost no one on the planet ever listens to you, <laughs> um, apart from that, it, uh, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's allowing those other things that obscure the highest self to take a break. Uh, and I believe that that's a common factor across just about any psychotherapy, even if you were doing a more directive type of therapy. If you're a half-decent listener and validator, mm -hmm. um, then you're going to activate that. Well, just, so we can yeah. be, just as we can be critical of other people not being good listeners, we're not good listeners to ourselves. And so yeah. you can think about like yeah. the, probably the same way that I listen to my wife is probably a similar way that I actually listen to my own feelings and some my own thoughts. And so some of those standard psychotherapeutic principles would be really good to internalize in our own worlds so we can learn to actually listen to ourselves because I think that's something that you're actually modeling yeah. day by day in psychotherapy. This is how you listen to yourself. And mm -hmm. as you do that, you're, you're able to access more of the inner healer. I talked to a client about that, that very thing this morning. Mm -hmm. You know, They were talking about how um, they've always been told that they're a good audience, that they really yeah. show up for people and that that's why people like them because you know, they feel, uh, this person um, makes other people feel seen and heard, but you know, she herself is incredibly insecure, fear, always afraid of being abandoned. And, and so we talked about being her own audience. How can she show up for herself mm -hmm. the way that she That's shows cool. up for others? Yeah, I like that. And the, uh, the partnership analogy, I think that applies a lot to the inner healing intelligence, treating that uh, kind of supreme self or that wisdom inside of us as a sacred partner on our journey through life where if you just come in hot yelling barking orders is not going to be received very well and if you if if, if it's a one-way street or you don't take time to listen you're not going to get anywhere or anything out of the the uh, innate intelligence there and we can learn from the shamans because like the the medical practice in me it's like you just did this thing, now this person's psychotic, and I can just jump to this conclusion of like, oh my goodness, this is a disaster, have we done? have to do this, yeah. yeah. And you know, the, the subtle thing that's not being spoken by the shaman is he has this conviction and this belief in that. So what can you do to be a better provider? You can believe in the inner healing intelligence, and in as much as you can do that, it'll make you a better provider. And yeah. same thing in like standard relationships, like I don't know how to heal you, but I know that that thing in you, whatever this concept, whatever name you want to ascribe to it, we're using inner healing intelligence, it's a good one. I believe in that inner healing intelligence, you have that, you'll, you'll find your way. I can trust in that, trust in that process, kind of step back and just step back and certain ways but be that person of support and compassion and presence yeah. in your life. Oh, I like that because you can only take someone as deep as you've gone yourself. Really that's it could be a takeaway is try this out yourself whether you're um, working on it to help clients or working on your own healing work is test it out. Um, take the time to listen to yourself and see what happens. Yeah.
Well, it's a good place to end. Test it so. out. Okay. I so, like it. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us today. Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers is brought to you by Novamind, a mental health company that specializes in psychedelic medicine and research. You can learn more about Novamind's mission to increase access to legal, safe, and evidence-based psychedelic medicine at novamind.ca. If you like what you heard today, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. This will help us get into the ears and faces of more people and help us put wind in the sails of the psychedelic medicine renaissance. Thanks for listening.